This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Grace to you and peace in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome to worship at the First Presbyterian Church of Warminster. And a special welcome to those who worship with us through WRDB FM radio. Today's liturgist is Cindy. And our musical gifts are offered by Kathy Worth Balkus on organ and piano. God's steadfast love endures forever. God's grace is sufficient for us. For in Christ, the weak are made strong. Worship now begins with the sounding of the chimes. Before turning to scripture, let us pray. Living God, help us so to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, and 9 and 10. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Look, we are your bone and flesh. For some time, while Saul was king over us, it was you who led out Israel and brought it in. The Lord said to you, It is you who shall be shepherd of my people Israel you who shall be ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. 
At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. David occupied the stronghold and named it the city of David. David built the city all around from, the, from Milo inwards. And David became greater and greater for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 through 10. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. gospel lesson is from the sixth chapter of Mark, verses 1 through 13. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, 
and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So the promised day has finally arrived. After years of fighting battles with the Philistines and barely surviving the murderous jealousy of King Saul, David finally becomes king of Israel. Now, by outward appearances, this account that we heard from 2 Samuel sounds like the happy ending to a story that began when he was a young man, the one chosen and anointed by God to replace Saul as Israel's ruler is finally recognized by all 12 tribes of Israel as their leader. And David acts quickly to unite these tribes under one ruler by taking over Jerusalem and making it the city of David, the royal city, which is a very shrewd strategy because Jerusalem conveniently is located between the northern and the southern tribes. This is no small accomplishment because David is the one who will transform the people of God from a loose, vulnerable, and unwieldy confederacy of tribes into a powerful united nation that is not to be messed with. But most importantly, David's rise to power means that God has fulfilled the promise that this shepherd boy would become their shepherd king. Now, this Old Testament lesson appears to provide a clean, decisive resolution to David's precarious yet providential rise to power. By uniting under one ruler, Israel is no longer the redheaded stepchild of the ancient Near East and is now well on its way to becoming a nation as secure and as successful as all the other nations. But that is by no means the end of the story. We cannot read about David's rise to power without knowing the larger story. The story that the anointed one will suffer the temptations and consequences of abusing his power. The story that in the generations following David, this united kingdom of Israel will divide against itself. The dynasty of David will fall to foreign powers 
and Israel will become exiled from the land it thought it had secured through establishing a monarchy. So although the Old Testament does remember the reign of David as a golden age of sorts, it also views Israel's rule under a monarchy with a heavy dose of skepticism. Although today's passage casts a celebratory tone of David's kingship, the larger story will not let us forget how very risky this whole notion of becoming a kingdom really is for Israel. After all, the idea of having a king was initiated by the people, not by God. It arose from their desperate search for security and strength, rather than from trusting in God's protection. And although God does respond to their need through the gift of David's leadership. The larger story reminds us all too well that not even the mightiest of warriors or the wisest of rulers can guarantee the success and security of the people of God. And this message is simply a retelling of an old story told again and again in scripture, which is that the Lord alone is our sovereign. The Lord alone gives security. In the end, isn't David's charisma or military might that carries Israel through it isn't the establishment of a monarchy or the organization of a kingdom that ultimately protects and strengthens the people of God. It is only God's faithfulness to David and to his flock that sustains Israel, not only at the heights of power, but also in the depths of weakness and despair. In the end, it is this faithfulness, God's faithfulness, that inspires the despised and homeless people of Israel to hope and to believe that God will act again through a Messiah who will far surpass the might and strength of David. Our two lessons from the New Testament follow the same pattern. In Mark's gospel lesson, we see Jesus, the Messiah, rejected by his own people in his own hometown because he just looks too weak to be the Messiah. And also he sends out the 12 disciples to proclaim the gospel, not through any mighty displays of strength or intelligent of their own, but simply because he gives them his own authority. In fact, nowhere in Mark do the disciples fully grasp who Jesus is or what the gospel truly means. And yet Jesus still chooses and empowers them to embody this good news. And from 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says that his own experience follows this same truth. And that is that it is in the message and not the messenger that God's power is displayed. The truth in today's scripture lessons invite us always to take the posture of humility and self-denial not from a sense of despair or self-hatred, but in the sense of trust and obedience to the one who for our sake became poor so that by his poverty, we might become rich. We are called to live out our faith while fully acknowledging our tendency to fall short of God's intentions, but also while fully trusting that the divine purpose will always work through us, even through our weaknesses. 
So our calling is not measured according to how well we achieve or succeed, but simply by how willing we are to turn toward God and to expect him to be able to show forth his glory, even when we are at our weakest, most vulnerable, and least attractive. Because we have not been chosen to succeed. We have been chosen to serve. Friends, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let us pray. Holy God, you have set us apart to carry your promises into the world. Our labor for your kingdom always begins with praising you and praying for others. So we pray for all people, Lord Jesus, that our divisions may cease and that all people may be one as you and the Father are one. We pray for the mission of your church, that in faithful witness, we may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. We pray for those who do not yet believe and for those who have lost their faith, that they may joyfully receive the light of the gospel. We pray to you, O Lord, for the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples. We pray to you, O Lord, for the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer, and all who are in danger, that they may be relieved and protected by your grace. We pray to you, O Lord, for our enemies, as well as for all whom we have injured or offended. And we pray for ourselves, for the forgiveness of our sins, and for the grace of the Holy Spirit to amend our lives. We pray for our families, friends, and neighbors, that being freed from anxiety, they may live in joy, peace, and health. O oh God, you promise to bless all the families of the earth through us, your people. Pour out your spirit on the whole creation. Bring the nations of the world into your fellowship and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Now let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve our neighbors. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever.